Welcome everyone. My name is Adam and I'll be your moderator. Dr. Tom Snyder is our speaker tonight and he'll be deep diving on practice value influencers. If anyone has a question, please feel free to type it into the box labeled have a question. And Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending tonight's presentation live or on demand. Tom, welcome. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining me with the webinar presentation, Valuation Strategies, Maximizing Your Value. We've got a lot of ground to cover tonight, and you'll see what I mean. First, we'll explain why valuations vary around the country and, and the trends that we see. We'll look at common valuation methods. We'll explore the top factors affecting a dental practice's value. We'll give you some hints to increase your practice value. Talk about developing an emergency exit strategy and finishing up with strategies on valuing record lists, particularly for solo practitioners. There are many reasons to value a dental practice. Obviously, the first and foremost in many people's minds is to uh, get your practice ready for a practice sale. However, a number of you, as you'll see, a growing number are actually considering partnerships. So there's a lot more valuations for partnership buy-ins and an eventual partnership buyout. Uh, emergency exit strategy, very few doctors consider this as a reason, but uh, as you'll learn later this evening, you'll see why this is extremely important to have your practice valued for that purpose. Also, it's good to have evaluation when you're doing some estate and financial planning if you're going to include your dental practice in your overall portfolio of assets. We'll talk about practice mergers and valuations. Practice valuations can also be done for matrimonial or partnership divorce and sometimes a special formulas are used for that purpose, as well as for personal goodwill valuation. This occurs if, in fact, you still have a C corporation. Uh, it would be a good idea to have your personal goodwill valued uh, for that purpose. Also, uh, for those of you who still may be considering converting your existing C corp to an S corp, uh, it's important to have a formal valuation because the Internal Revenue Service would like to see that if you were ever audited. Well, there's lots of things that are going on in our profession, notwithstanding how we survived uh, the pandemic and where we're headed from uh, here. Now we're in the in the cusp. Uh, I guess we're a recession. If you look at the numbers, it's it's pretty close to that. So there's some concerns about the immediate future and the impact of uh, recession on dental practice. But more importantly, from a longer view, let's look at some of the things that have been going on. One thing for sure we've seen, and this information comes from the American Dental Association's Health Policy Institute. And in 2015, there were 50.3% of dentists who were classified as solo practitioners. But with COVID, this number really accelerated. Uh, in 2019, it decreased to 46.2. And I'm sure that number is going to increase even more in the ensuing year. Uh, so basically, we have some things going on with the solo practice model. Uh, in my generation, most dentists who wanted to own their own business wanted to be a solo practitioner. But that number has gradually been eroding over the years. Suffice it to say that the American Dental Association's Health Policy Institute surveyed doctors under the age of 35, and only one in five doctors wanted to be a solo practitioner. So when you look at the number of solo practitioners that are still out there, if you're thinking of an exit strategy, uh, it may be more challenging to find a buyer for your practice, particularly uh, where your practice may be located. Now, here's a more sobering statistic relative to practice ownership. Again, a generation ago or two, uh, most doctors wanted to have their own business. That's not the case today. As you can see, uh, practice ownership uh, declined in 2005 from 84.7 to 73 percent. That's a big drop. That's almost, you know, one in every four dentists who don't want to own. Where we've seen some market difference is with female dentist ownership. Uh, in 2005, it was at 68.1 percent, but in 2021, it's now down to 59.6 percent. 
Hard to say where that's going to end, but obviously that's a major drop. Male ownership continues to be relatively strong, uh, 88.5 in 2005 to 80.3 in 2021. Still, uh, one in every five male dentists uh, doesn't want to own. Now, part of this may be due to the fact of the high educational debt that many of our recent grads are dealing with. Uh, on the other hand, it's interesting to note that in the class of 2021, 17% uh, of dentists had no debt whatsoever. However, 39% of that same class had debt in excess of 300,000. So it's suffice it to say that one of the things we may be seeing, because these studies are done at, at points in time, is maybe a lot of the younger doctors feel that they can't own a practice and that they're gonna work for a while uh, until they can reduce that debt load. Or conversely, it may be that from the standpoint of career options, uh, not as many doctors wanna be entrepreneurs. So that's something that remains to be seen, but it's a trend that we need to keep in mind because obviously if you're thinking long-term of selling your practice, there may be less doctors out there who are willing to buy practices, whether it's a solo practice or of course, just a practice in general. So in this slide, we have an interesting uh, portrayal of age differential. We see that we're about equal with the number of doctors age 65 plus, who obviously are candidates for retirement. On the far right, we see about the equal number of doctors under the age of 35. So in our dental workforce, uh, we see a, a, a significant divide. Now, obviously, to the left, the doctors over age 65 over the next five to 10 years, there's going to be an acceleration in the number of retirements, as we'll see in a second. We also find that our dental profession is now, on average, getting a little bit younger. Uh, our retirement age now is at 67.9 uh, years old in 2021 compared to what it was in 2018 at 67.9. But recently released statistics again from the American Dental Association showed that there was a significant increase in doctor retirements in 2021. And that with confidence, this is going to continue to accelerate. Obviously the pandemic was a good fuel booster for many doctors to decide that they would like to retire sooner than later. As a matter of fact, when looked at dentists over the age of 55, there was a 22% increase in that age group in 2021 compared to a four-year average of doctors retiring. So uh, it's accelerating. We had more doctors who are going to be leaving the workforce. But on the flip side, we still have a very large number of doctors coming into the profession whether it's recent grads, which continue to, to increase because there are some new dental schools uh, going to be opening in addition, the number of foreign doctors who are coming in, as well as doctors who want to get their licenses restated. So we have a fairly healthy inflow of doctors coming in as well as exiting. Uh, practice consolidation, growth of corporate dentistry and DSOs continues to accelerate and where that's going to end, no one really knows. We do know there's a lot of private equity money still out there, and the growth rate uh, is pretty phenomenal. Uh, the most recent statistic that we have available is from 2019, and it showed that 10.4% of U.S. dentists were affiliated with DSOs. One thing for certain is we'll be talking in a minute about values that we still are in a seller's market and will be for some time. Uh, whether longer term, when we have less doctors owning and things of that nature, uh, perhaps there may be uh, a reduction, but from what we see right now, uh, practice values show no signs of withering. So let's get to the meat of the matter. What is a dental practice worth? And how is that value determined? From our experience, uh, because we also uh, are brokers on a national basis, we do hundreds of transactions a year, so we have a pretty good feel for what practices sell for, not only what they should be valued at, so we're, we have pretty reliable data. But suffice it to say, whether it's a specialty practice or a general practice, the majority of practice values uh, vary between 60 to 85% of prior year's gross revenue. And of course, as we'll talk, 
shortly, there are a number of factors that lead to this variance. However, the predominant factor in this valuation differential is geographic location. And if we were up in the state of Maine, uh, we might, may find values to be in the 60, 65% range, perhaps in an urban area. Uh, in Maine, it may be a little higher. If we go to the Commonwealth of Virginia, we see a wide variation in values where if you're in the southwest part of Virginia, close to the Kentucky, North Carolina border, more in the mountains, uh, you're going to find practices in the 60s. However, uh, you get closer to Washington, D.C., and that Washington, D.C. metro area has values between 90, 95 percent of last year's gross receipts. North Carolina, for example, Raleigh, Durham, uh, Charlotte, 85 to 90, rural North Carolina, 60, 65. The same holds true for South Carolina in the urban areas. Florida, uh, in the, in the 70s, we move out to the Midwest. Uh, in the Midwest, we're seeing 70, 75 percent, maybe 80 percent value. If we go out to California, uh, Northern California's practices value a little bit lower than Southern California. And so the case is. And what we know for sure is values are driven by what? They're driven by supply and demand. Obviously, practices in rural areas, which have taken are taking a beating as far as value, is only because they it's not the practice, it's not the owner, it's the fact there are no dentists who want to live in those areas. Hence why we have variations in value, where we have population clusters, uh, we find higher values because we have more doctors who want to buy that practice that's on the market, and oftentimes they they have a bidding war. So it keeps pushing prices up. In addition to which, we know that in the corporate side that uh, corporate values are still high. Uh, obviously, uh, if you're comparing what we call a private sale, which is between doctor to doctor, those values that can be uh, commanded by a seller are considerably less than if you were to sell to a DSO or a corporate entity. So hence the, valu the valuation variation. I want to discuss a definition right now. It's called transaction value. And this is the value that we use when we value your dental practice. And that simply is the price that the practice assets are likely to bring as a going concern in a particular geographic area. Now, those practice assets are tangible and intangible assets, which we'll cover in a moment. Uh, you might find uh, valuation documents that you had maybe prepared where the valuator evaluator uses the term fair market value. The problem with fair market value definition is that true definition, which was really instituted by the Internal Revenue Service back in the prohibition area, is one where we have a hypothetical buyer and a hypothetical seller without any kind of coercion to transact the practice. Well, that's not the case in our dental world when we have a seller who wants to pay us to value their practice because they want, a, they want a transaction. The same thing a buyer may want to pay for evaluation for practice they wish to purchase. So there's no hypothetical buyers and sellers, hence it's a transaction value. Practice values consist of two asset classes. Number one, tangible assets. Number two, tangible. Now you'll see two numbers here, 75%. 75% relates to a study that I did maybe, oh, seven, eight years ago, where we looked at hundreds of practice values, and we wanted to determine what percentage of the total value, whether the value was 80% or 70% or 90% of last year's gross receipts, what did the intangible assets consist of? And we found it was around 75%. For tangible assets, 25%. Now, of course, those numbers may change if you have an office with brand new equipment, technology, and if you are a tenant, maybe lots of leasehold build-outs, we, uh, we've seen that ratio reverse to maybe 60-40, 60% intangible, 40% tangible. By and large, uh, the rule of thumb really is what I just stated. 
So what are tangible assets? Pretty self-explanatory. Your dental and business equipment, technology, instruments and supplies, and leasehold improvements. So I have that asterisk because if you own your property, uh, chances are you may have a separate business entity and those leaseholds may reside in the tax return for that business entity. That's why it's there. But if you're renting or you're a tenant, uh, leasehold improvements would be included. Now, the intangible assets, the majority of a practice's value, primarily is goodwill. Uh, if you're doing a transaction for a retirement or sale, there is a restricted government uh, allocation, but that's relatively minimal. And of course, there's a, an allocation for the patient list you'll be transferring. And in some cases, particularly multi-office locations and or specialty practices, there is a phone number allocated as well. One thing I wanna stress, most dental evaluators subscribe to this exclusion. That is accounts receivable and cash and liabilities or debt are not included as part of a dental practice's value. So if we value your practice at $800,000, we don't include your accounts receivable, which may theoretically be, let's say 100,000, and let's say you had 30,000 in cash, <coughs> excuse me, uh, that would not be included. That would have to be factored in, as well as any liabilities, which would reduce the value if you're gonna be transacting uh, equity. So let's talk about some of the common valuation approaches. First is the market approach. And in the market approach, what we're trying to do is determine what does a practice comparably sell for in a particular geographic area. And to that point, we use a method called the guideline transaction method. And as such, we use multiple databases. Uh, predominantly, they are the Goodwill Registry, Pratt's De Deal Stats. Deal Stats is the name of the new company as the uh, Pratt's company was, was uh, sold recently and it's now called Deal Stats. And of course, our own uh, database as we sold hundreds and hundreds of practices. So we have lots of data on what practices really transacted at. So that's what it is. It's a comparative uh, situation to give you an idea what it's worth. In fact, this is an excerpt from our actual valuation report. This was a practice in New England where based on the size of the, uh, the metropolitan area we're working with, we break it down uh, to the region of the country as well, in many instances, as to the state and come up with the variation there on value. Now, I wanna digress for a minute to talk about something that one needs to think about. And this is particularly more if some of uh, you folks are thinking of buying a practice and how you'd like that practice value. And, the one thing I'm gonna caution is that this particular method may give you some false positives. So we're gonna talk about the gross revenue multiplier. And what that simply is, is taking your practice receipts and multiplying it by a percentage to come up with a practice value. So let's see how that may have an impact if you were trying to decide to buy practice A or practice B. And so practice A has gross receipts of 400,000 and we're gonna use a multiplier of 70%, so the value of the practice would be 280,000. Practice B <clears throat> has gross receipts of 600,000, and we use the same multiplier. So that value is 420. So practice A, you make an investment of 280. Practice B, you make an investment of 420. Now, what do you get for that investment? Well, in practice A, Let's assume that the overhead was 50%, which is reasonable for smaller practices because less staff size, less cost, et cetera. So in this case, practice A had net income of 200,000. Practice B, on the other hand, gross receipts of 600. However, <clears throat> more staff, let's say there was a, maybe some more PPO uh, participation, uh, higher overhead. So the overhead here is about 66 and two third percent, same net income. So we have practice A and practice B, same net income, significant difference in sale price. So which one would you buy? Now one could argue, well, I could buy the $600,000 practice and I could get that overhead down to 60% and I'd make more money. But again, this is just gives you an idea that if someone just throws out a percentage, 
it really doesn't drill down like we do when we do evaluation to really understand what you're really getting for the price that you're willing to pay. The next method is called the income approach. And this is the most uh, popular method. This is the method that most of the dental advisors for purchasers will look at. And there's various formulas that can be used. Uh, in this case, we're going to be looking at an evaluation of the cash flow. So typically what we like to have is four years of financials. Obviously, we prefer to have tax returns. And if the practice does have uh, profit and loss statements, we'd like to have those as well. Uh, what valuators do when they look at this information is they normalize certain expenses. And those have to be consistent with national norms and practice historical performance. So what are the typical normalized expense uh, items? They are dental supplies, office expense, rent, professional fees, building, repairs, and maintenance. And if we look at rent, obviously, for those doctors who own their own building, uh, have you really assessed yourself a rent over the years that you owned it? Is that rent above or below market, or do you not charge a rent at all? Obviously, uh, from an evaluation point of view, we've got to look at that because that could manipulate the net income of the practice, which would have an impact on the method that we're going to be using to value in the income approach. Also, there are expenses that we call discretionary, and they're added back to net income. Continuing education, travel, gifts and contributions, certain expenses, owner's health insurance, owner's pension contribution, family members' compensation, and dues and subscriptions. So these are what we call discretionary, meaning if I bought this practice, I don't have to do any of these things if I don't want to. So what we're trying to do is calculate a benefit stream. So we look at the net income as reported on the tax return. We then add back the discretionary expenses. We then either subtract or add normalizing adjustments for rent supplies. For example, if the rent is under market, we have to adjust it. If it's over market, we adjust it either plus or minus. Again, it depends on what we're adjusting. So what we're trying to come up with is a benefit stream for a normal owner doctor. This is another example from our valuation report, not to get into all the detail, but it gives you an idea of how we break things out. This is what we call an adjusted income statement. So we're looking at the earnings before income taxes, and you'll see normalization adjustments. Some of the things that we talked about, we actually normalize the doctor's salaries too, right? Because no doctor really sits back and says, this is what I'm gonna pay myself. Uh, usually they take what they can get or they come up with a nominal salary. What we do is use industry standards to come up with what we call doctor's comp and then make adjustments plus or minus for doctor's salaries. So at the end of the day, without getting into the weeds here and all the detail, what we're looking at is what are the real earnings? We impute taxes. We're going to look at the adjusted EBITDA, uh, the adjusted EBIT, uh, and then come up with what we call the seller's discretionaries discretionary earnings. And that, if we look here at the third line from the bottom, we see 478,258. That's really the cash flow with all the adjustments we're going to make that a buyer could anticipate receiving if they own this practice. And then we do something with those earnings. What do we do with them? Well, we capitalize them. So it's called a capitalized cash flow. So what we do is we base a value on the present value of the future economic benefits. So we go out in time and we usually use a standard growth rate, usually it's 3%, and we come back and say, what are those values, those seller earnings today, what are they worth? And that will really help determine the, 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 the value of the practice. What's available for the non-operator owner? Because, you know, in the case of a DSO, we'll talk about EBITDA in a minute, they're looking at certain metrics before they make their investment to buy a practice. Now, when you're looking at a capitalized cash flow, you're using mathematical formulas to adjust this cash flow, either up or down. So we look at various risk factors. Is it a specialty? If so, what type of referral base? Do we have a referral base of three doctors or 20 doctors? Uh, what about the size of the patient base? What about the fees, the payer mix? Do we have a preponderance of Medicaid? Is it a FIFA service practice? Is it heavily PPO or a combination of the above? 
of course, where is the practice located? In a rural area, that's going to increase the risk factor because we know there aren't as many doctors going there. And then we look at the financial market returns using standard uh, Wall Street statistics. The bottom line is we try to come up with a return on equity, and that's how we determine a cap rate. So suffice it to say, all you really know, need to know is the higher the cap rate, the lower the value. The lower the cap rate, the higher the value. Lower cap rate means less risk. Higher cap rate means more risk. Hence, the value will be adjusted accordingly. And the final method we use is called the asset approach. This is a fairly simple uh, method to understand. Granted, the income approach gets a little complicated because of the methodology we use to come up with our value. But in the asset approach, we're looking at the assets. We identify them from the material that is given to us on the tax return. We typically refer to the asset depreciation schedule and or invoices and or reports from the accountant. So we restate those to market value. Uh, we then know what our tangible assets are worth. We also use some formulas to come up with the market value of supplies and inventory. Now, that takes care of the tangible assets. Intangible assets, again, we're going to look at our uh, practice databases to come up with a percentage of what we think the goodwill is worth, and that will give us a final number. So at the end, we take the value from the guideline transaction, we take the capitalized cash flow method, and we take the asset method, divide them by three, and that gives us our transaction value for your practice. Now, I mentioned before, obviously, we have more and more uh, corporate acquisitions, and they use uh, a metric called EBITDA, and that EBITDA is defined as earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization, okay? And this EBITDA came from the private equity market. That's what private equity people use to value other businesses. So when they uh, came into the dental space, they looked at our practice valuations and said, okay, that's nice, but this is how we like to do it. This is what we're familiar with because we're Wall Street people. This is how people live and die by looking at EBITDA. That's how they're going to value your practice. So what does that typically mean to you? Well, once EBITDA is calculated, we see for solo general practices, typically, uh, you will find your value to be between three to four times EBITDA. You may get lucky and get a little bit higher if your practice is highly desirable because three or four DSOs want to set a footprint in your market, but that's usually not the case. What that means to you is you'll receive typically between 75 to 125 percent of last year's gross receipts. And quite frankly, usually it's in excess of 100 percent. However, for those of you who've been approached by DSOs know that you usually don't get all of that in cash. Typically, when you do a private sale and get uh, bank financing for the purchaser, you'll get 100% of your value when you sell. That's not necessarily the case with DSOs, so they can afford to pay a higher multiple because they're going to hold back some of that value and ask you to work for a period of time. Again, that's just a personal decision on what you'd like to do with selling your practice. Now, if we look at multiple practices, the numbers get very rich. So we can see 12 times EBITDA or more for those types of practices. So when we calculate EBITDA, you know, even DSOs have a different way of calculating it. What they're going to do is do adjustments like we stated Sometimes the adjustments may not be the same as we may do as valuators, but suffice it to say, they do normalization adjustments. And they also will impute what's called an owner's compensation. And that could vary anywhere between 30 to 35% based on the DSO. Because again, remember, what they're trying to do is come up with this, this EBITDA calculation to determine what they're willing to pay for your business. So again, no two DSOs calculate EBITDA identically the same, okay? So again, it's the old story, lower risk, higher multiple, or higher EBITDA, higher value, higher risk, lower multiple, and or lower EBITDA equals lower value. So again, let's look at the, the few characteristics. Now we're talking more about a private sale, okay? So in a private sale, obviously, as I stated before, area demographics are really the key driver here. 
And that's going to be based on whether you're urban, suburban, small town and rural. And as I referenced before, small town or rural practices don't command anywhere near the value as their urban and suburban counterparts because the number of doctors who wish to practice or own in those areas uh, is not as robust as in the suburban and urban areas. Uh, what type of industry may be in the area? What's the economy like? Is it strong? Is it growing? Uh, is there new development, new housing starts, all that kind of good stuff, uh, which you know will tend to have a higher value in areas that are really taking off and doing well demographically. Now, obviously, facility, uh, how many treatment rooms? Uh, that has a direct bearing, right, on what you're going to be receiving. Because if you have a two treatment room facility and no room for expansion, you may not get top dollar versus you have a four or five treatment room uh, facility with or without uh, expansion capability. So that value would, if we compared apples to oranges, it would be, uh, it would be probably, you know, uh, the smaller practice gets the lower value. Okay, aging condition of equipment. Again, some, some owners don't really care about that because they're gonna buy new equipment. However, if the equipment's really old, they may use that against you and say, well, I've got to spend another $200,000. So you're not going to get 600. Maybe I'll give you 450 because I have to borrow extra uh, money to buy new equipment. So again, that has an impact as well as the absence of technology. There's very few doctors now who do not have any type of technology, but there's a lot of doctors who necessarily aren't up to date on their technology and that could be used against you by a purchaser as far as value. Uh, is there room for expansion? You know, again, depending on who the buyer is, what their objectives are for your practice, that could work against you if there is no room for expansion. And of course, you know, the business and reception areas, are they reasonable size, et cetera. Another major contributor uh, is the operating overhead. Obviously, uh, would you rather buy a, a, a practice with a 50% operating overhead versus a practice with 70%? Answer is you probably would go for the 50% as long as it was a reasonable practice. Now, not to put down doctors who have high overhead, uh, because if their overhead is high, it doesn't mean they mismanage their practice. It may well be that they have long-term employees that have been with them 20, 25 years. And so they may be on the pension plan, and depending on the type of pension plan, it could be pretty robust. Consequently, Oftentimes in high overhead practices, the big driver is staff salaries, which could be 30 to 35%. And in urban areas uh, where we have high occupancy costs, that could drive up the value as well. So it does have an impact on your value. Some other uh, components that affect value are specialty procedures. For example, if you are selling your practice and you do a lot of orthodontic uh, treatment, and if the purchaser does not want to uh, continue that, wants you to finish cases, and the practice is worth 800,000, and maybe you're doing 200,000 in orthodontic services, they may want a discount. Same goes, for example, sleep medicine. You may be doing that, and depending on the ratio of sleep medicine uh, services to overall service mix, even though your sleep medicine uh, may have been included in the receipts for the valuation, there may be a reduction in price. So again, that's on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, as I said before, insurance plans could have uh, a deleterious effect on value. Uh, Delta Premier, there are a lot of HMOs, Medicaid or Medicare in the practice could move the needle uh, downward. Uh, staff instability, uh, sometimes that could work against you. Uh, Non-transferable telephone number and a website, we've seen that where there might be a slight reduction in value because those assets, which could be very valuable in growing the practice or continuing its growth, are no longer available. And of course, an associate without an enforceable and transferable restrictive covenant. And finally, for those doctors who are tenants, if you're on the last year of a lease and there's no chance for, for renewability, that certainly is going to have an impact on your value. So let's assume you get your practice value. Uh, and you just want to know what it's worth. You were, you're doing some transition planning, which we uh, wholeheartedly recommend, and you come up with a value. And you say, well, you know, I'm thinking of maybe selling my practice in five years, but, you know, my practice is only worth 600000 I'd like to get 800000 Well, 
how can we make that happen? Well, the first thing is, let's look at the practices receipts. Uh, when was the last time a fee analysis was done? And if so, where are you as far as percentiles? So considering a fee increase really is not a bad idea, particularly if you have not increased your fees in recent memory. Uh, during the pandemic, there were a number of uh, studies done by groups who were surveyed every month, and we always found that 25 to 30 percent of doctors, as they were coming out of the pandemic, were going to increase their dental fees because of increased costs to operate their practice. So again, uh, we're in a high inflation time, prices are up, so don't uh, not consider a fee increase because that gives you an immediate increase in top line as well as in the bottom line. Now, if you're in a market where there's some older doctors, some older solo practitioners, knowing what uh, we know that the number of solos are uh, decreasing, the number of younger doctors aren't interested <clears throat> in purchasing, there may be some records out there for you to purchase from a retiring doctor. <clears throat> Excuse me, and that may be a great way to increase your top line. Uh, how about your hygiene department? If you're a general practitioner, are there opportunities to improve hygiene? You know, looking at your production report, the uh, production report uh, by service mix, and you know, there are many perio related procedures. And when you have an adult population with periodontal disease, maybe you should consider doing something about that. That's why a lot of times doctors may bring in someone to consult with them to help them enhance their hygiene department to grow their top line as well as their bottom line. And of course, developing a marketing plan. Maybe you're going to head more towards a social media focus. Uh, maybe hire someone to develop a website or enhance your current website. And of course, finally, uh, looking at your service mix, can new services be added? And maybe if you're considering bringing in an associate, that may be one of the reasons to bring an associate in. So they could provide services that you are now routinely referring out to area specialists. So let's look at the facility. What things could we do there? Have your staff take a walkthrough and tell them to give you an honest assessment. If they were a patient, how would they rate your practice as far as comfort, up-to-date furniture? <clears throat> you know, how about paint, you know, carpet in the uh, reception area? You name it, anything that could enhance the value outside the building perhaps as well. Uh, how about considering upgrading your dental equipment or your clinical technology? Uh, but, in fact, if you're not going to be retiring for a few years and want to make these investments, one thing to really keep in mind is that a dollar investment in technology or equipment does not necessarily mean you get a dollar a dollar return on that investment on your practice value. So just something to keep in mind. More importantly, not just to make your practice more curb appealing, is can your investment in these aspect, assets really increase your ability to produce, provide services? Hopefully the answer is a resounding yes. One note of caution, if you do plan to sell your practice in a 12 to 24 month period, you should confer with your CPA about potential tax ramifications because that could be a particular problem you may be subject to what's called depreciation recapture. Just something to keep in mind. Now on the net profit side, what can we do to improve our net profit, which hopefully drives that seller discretionary earnings, which hopefully will drive a higher value, right, using the cap uh, method. So review your overhead ratios with reliable comparable statistics. Where do you stand in all your ratios? And if they're a little bit high, <clears throat> is there something you could do as a manager and business owner to make those numbers better to improve your profit? If you have a high staff ratio, take a critical look at your staffing. Are you a little overstaffed? Uh, take, a, take a critical look at that because that is usually the, the root cause of most high overhead practices. And going back to considering a fee increase, just to give you an idea of the power of what a fee increase can do on the bottom line without you doing nothing else. If you, for example, were to increase your fees by 5%, and let's assume you have a 40% profit margin, which is a uh, 
60% overhead ratio, you can generate an increase of 11% of your net profit. So greater than two to one for a 5% fee increase. And you can play with the numbers yourself before you make a fee increase just to convince yourself to see how you could benefit not only from a top line increase, but more importantly, from a bottom line increase. And finally, if you have lots of PPOs, uh, do a critical look at your PPO performance and maybe start weeding out those lower performing PPOs, which are really not benefiting your practice. So let's switch gears now, get out of the valuation world, and let's talk about the importance of an exit strategy. Obviously, if you've heard me speak or other members of our team talk about uh, planning, you know, we are big proponents of transition planning, uh, and that can be done at any point in time in your career. It's not just the end. It could be during your career. And why is it important? Well, it's number one, if you're still in your 30s and 40s, <clears throat> Having a plan as exit strategy is nice, but it's not as critical. It's more of a long-term event, but having an emergency exit strategy is something everyone should have because one never knows what's going to happen tomorrow. And unfortunately, in the business that we're in, we get many phone calls from doctors who unfortunately uh, uh, are ill uh, and they have to sell. They, they, they can't return to their practice. And of course, we get cases where doctors pass suddenly, and we have to work with the uh, survivors to try to sell that practice. And so I don't know if you're aware of this, but only 30% of practices for sell if a doctor dies and uh, within 90 days. So obviously, depending on what type of practice, was it a specialty practice? Was it a general practice? Did the practice stay open with the hygienist still employed? Were there at least uh, procedures being done? Was there a, a locum tenants doctor coming in to help keep the practice alive? Or did the doctor pass away and the doors were shut and nothing happened? That's where we see dramatic decreases. And of course, uh, we find that only an additional 10% will sell after 90 days. So it's an obvious fact, the longer that practice stays closed, the chances of, of that practice uh, getting any value is almost nil. So uh, we find that uh, 60 percent of practices do not sell at all if the practice is delayed more than 90 days. So pretty sobering statistic, but let's be positive and see what we can do proactively. So what we hardly recommend for anybody on this webinar, whether you uh, owned a practice for five years, 10 years, 20, 30 or more, and you're not ready to retire, we understand that, but at least get your practice valued and have a letter of instruction prepared. And what that is, is a list of items that you need uh, to have done by your representatives, whether it's a broker or someone else, to take care of things. And uh, we'll talk about this, how you can get this letter of instruction in a minute, but uh, it's a detailed worksheet that you fill out and give it to your spouse and your advisor. So in the unlikely event, something happens to you that an action plan can be taken into effect immediately because that's what you have to do, particularly when the doctor has uh, passed away. You've got to get on it, and at a very difficult time, of course, but we need to get that going. So, my question is, do you have an emergency exit strategy? And if so, why not? So for those solo practitioners, obviously we mentioned there's a lot of things going on. There's gonna be a lot less buyers out there. Uh, but there are opportunities where you may not be able to sell your practice as what we call a going concern, meaning at your current location with your equipment, but you may be able to find a doctor in your community who needs to bring an associate in or has an associate, wants to become a partner, or a doctor who just wants to increase their receipts, like we mentioned earlier. Uh, perhaps uh, selling your patient list can be a way for you to get something for your career as opposed to closing your doors and maybe selling your records for $2,500. So that I always find to be a very uh, sobering uh, way to end a career. And hopefully none of you have to do it that way, that there are strategies to get something for your effort in the career that you, you've had. So let's look at two ways to do it. One is called a production of revenue acquisition valuation method. And in this particular case, what we're going to do is uh, have the buyer pay you a 
fixed percentage of practice receipts from any of your patients. Typically, we see if it's a two-year payout period, 25%, three-year period, 20%. Now, obviously, these percentages are percentages we prefer to get, but not all buyers might not want to be as generous. So now that's something you have to negotiate the percentage, but at least uh, have it over a period of time. And obviously, the, the longer the period of time, the lower the percentage. So typically, in this type of method, who's taking the risk? The seller is, right? If you're going to be waiting for your uh, money uh, over a period of time, uh, you're taking the risk. So we at least would like you to receive an initial down payment. And then what we try to do is get you 75% of the weighted average revenue over the last three years. So you may say, why should I pay 75% for this doctor whose records I'm buying? Because remember, it only is 75% if all the patients come through the door in the prescribed period. And I haven't seen a doctor yet <clears throat> who buys records who hasn't really done very well in terms of how they've taken those patients and made them better patients maybe better treatment acceptance, application of technology, hygiene, you name it. Uh, it's a rare day that we've seen a record acquisition go bust. Usually they're, they're pretty darn good for buyers. So in this case, that's why we use that 75% ratio. We try to get that for our clients. Uh, payments are usually made on a quarterly basis, and the payments really don't start till after the down payment has been earned. So for example, if uh, I give you $25,000 as the seller, uh, there's got to be $25,000 in collectible receipts based on the percentage you're going to receive. Once that's paid, then you start getting real money from the balance, okay? Now, in this case, since the seller is taking all the risk, they should reserve the right for an audit if, in fact, the seller feels that, you know, these payments seem awfully low. I, You know, I, I, I know I'm totally dependent on this doctor and Maybe we want to check out the computer records. So here's how the numbers work. Let's assume we have a weighted average on the left of $300,000 for a practice, and we're going to try to get you 75%. So the sale price would be $225,000. And we're going to use a three-year term and a 20% payout. We're going to request a down payment of $25,000. So now let's look at year one. Well, in year one, the practice did three sixty. dollars Not surprising. If the patients do come to the new location, now you're probably doing the math in your head saying, well, wait a minute, there's only 47000 Yeah, but what about the 25000 down payment? So that has to be part of that first year payout. So in year two, uh, the practice jumps to four hundred. So 20% is 80000 In year three, the practice jumps again to four thirty. Okay, and that equals 73000 Now... 20% of that would be 86000 But in this case, when the sale price is met, whatever year it is, the payments stop. So that's what happened. So the two twenty five dollars was realized in year three, not at the end of the year, but sometime probably in the third quarter, and no more payments were made uh, to the seller. Obviously, if the practice didn't do well, then that 225 may not be realized. That usually doesn't happen, but sometimes it could. But at least that's a way where the buyer doesn't have a big risk and the seller is taking the majority of it. Another way to do it, a little, little uh, less complicated. And by the way, in some states, uh, that percentage methodology could be considered fee splitting. So again, make sure that, uh, check with your counsel that if you're going to do it, that you comply with uh, state board uh, rules and regulations. We wouldn't want anybody getting any trouble uh, for that. So that's something that could be easily found out with a legal inquiry. So the individual record purchase, we're going to look at the last three years of receipts. Uh, we'll divide that average number by the number of patients having one patient visit in the last 18 months, and we'll come up with a per record charge. Uh, we typically like to pay the doctors uh, over an 18 to 24 month period. Typically, the record fee is paid after the second visit. So if for whatever reason, the patient felt that the traveling distance was too long, they didn't like the doctor or whatever, 
uh, if they come in the second time, that means they're, they want to come back so the payment is made. So we covered a lot of ground tonight. Uh, I hope that you found this to be of value to you, no matter where you are in the stage of your career, because uh, all this stuff is really applicable, particularly the emergency exit strategy. And as I said before, if you're interested in that, you can download a letter of instruction at henryshinedpt.com backslash what if. And that way uh, you'll have this document and we hope that you'll have us value your practice so you can develop that emergency exit strategy uh, for this year. Now also, uh, since you've been kind enough to spend some time uh, with me this evening, uh, we really do encourage uh, folks to get evaluation and get that emergency exit strategy underway. So anybody signs up for one, we're gonna give you a 10% uh, reduction in our fee for your practice valuation. Uh, however, uh, we have some disclaimers uh, that uh, this offer is not forever. It's till July 15th and uh, it must be on a full price valuation. So hopefully you'll take advantage of that. And if so, uh, you can see the information online uh, and do it accordingly. So hopefully uh, you folks got a lot out of it tonight. Uh, obviously, uh, if you have any uh, particular questions, you can certainly send them to webinars at henryshine.com and direct them to my attention. And I'm more than happy to answer those uh, emails uh, because I covered a lot of ground and there may be some things for you that may be of interest. And uh, hopefully uh, you got a lot out of it tonight. And since this is recorded, you can watch it as many times as you'd like. So I wanna thank you once again for taking the time to be with me this evening. And I wish you a, a good evening and enjoy the rest of the summer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom, as always, for your excellent presentation. And thanks to everyone for attending. We appreciate your feedback via our survey that will pop up on your screen shortly. We did record tonight's webinar, so we will email the recording out via email sometime in the next week. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night.